I'm Joanna Shanks. I'm Emma Taylor. And this is Murder She Spoke. Hi, Emma. How are you this week? I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So we've actually had some nice uh, listener feedback this week. So I'll just read it out before we get into the true crime recommendations. So it's from John, a listener, and he says, Hello, ladies. Just wanted to stop in and say hi and to thank you for your show. I listened from America. I just binged all of your episodes in less than a month while I was working. I came for the accent and the true crime. I stayed for your personalities. Thank you very much for keeping me company and for your work of highlighting the victims of crime. Keep up the good work. That is so sweet. That's really nice, isn't it? So- he thinks we have personalities. That is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we have personalities. Yay! <laughs> and do you know what, though? Like, I, I think we've both got into podcasts from doing stuff and I know that feeling of being kept company and I like it and it's quite yeah, nice to think that we're doing that for other people so yeah whatever you're doing if you're doing housework you got this if you're doing work you got this if you're out for a run holy crap well done love that and yeah, yeah. if you're just doing absolutely nothing and vegging out you got this we love feedback keep it coming yeah and um, like I if agree. you hate it you don't really need to tell us that so much because we might cry. But if you are loving the podcast, then please do let us know because it really does brighten our day. So, yeah, talking of good reviews, uh, we do actually have a little competition for our listeners. So if you would like to win this CBS catch up torch bag with book by Christopher Berridi talking with female serial killers. We are and not affiliated. <laughs> some sweets and a Murder She Spoke sticker and badge. Then please leave us a review on your favourite podcast platform that you're able to leave a review on, obviously. And screenshot us your review and send it to us on socials or info at murdershespoke.net and we will choose a winner at random. Yeah, so we'll give you uh, obviously a few weeks to do it from this episode being live. So we will pick the winner at the end of November 2023 and we'll reach out to you and send it out. So yeah, good luck and thanks in advance. <laughs> Hopefully the <they're> nice <laughs> reviews. <laughs> Although would you really want stuff from a podcast that you didn't like? Maybe not. Yeah. People do love free stuff. So yeah, if you want to be with a chance of winning that goodie bag, then yeah, please leave us a review, screenshot it, send it to us and uh, you might be chosen. So Emma, true crime recommendations this week. What do you have for us? I have a Netflix documentary, which I believe you've seen as well. Uh, American Murder, The Family Next Door. It's about Shanann and Chris Watts. Um, Yeah. Oh, such a such a difficult story that one, isn't it? It's really, really hard. I just really struggle. But the the way that the reason that I liked this one was that it used actual footage from mm-hmm. CCTV and the body cams and also videos from her social media. Uh so you could hear her own voice, you could hear her talking about Chris and and talking about the kids and talking about their life together and I think her family had given permission so there was also text messages her friends were on there so it was more of a a proper understanding there wasn't actors being used or anything like that the only thing I would say is they kind of felt I kind of felt like they were trying to portray Shanann as irritating or uh, almost as if giving him an out a little bit because their marriage wasn't great as if that's a reason um just obviously spoiler alert but unfortunately um Chris Watts was a terrible human who murdered his wife two children and unborn child because he is probably a sociopath but had a mistress and didn't want his life anymore basically um and then whoops totally blase about it and on the news and speaking to cops and everyone and 
then tried to kind of blame her as well for part of it, which is just awful. But yeah, I think there was a really weird vibe where they were they were portraying Shanann as a harpy, you know, this like nagging wife stereotype. And mm -hmm. I didn't like that. I, I know you can't look at every victim through rose tinted glasses and say that they were perfect, but I didn't think there was any need for how much time was given to kind of showing how difficult she supposedly was because you can be as difficult as you like you don't deserve to get murdered mm -hmm. so let me know if anyone watched it and they agree with me or if you think I'm being a bit OTT but uh, yeah I just didn't enjoy that part of it how about yeah. you no I agree I think the, you feel the same, I, kind of. yeah I really liked the fact that it was like body cam footage I thought that was really interesting um because like we've talked about on other episodes, a lot of the sort of formula for documentaries is talking heads, you know, detect maybe detectives that worked on the case. They talk about what, you know, the perpetrator was like, you know, there's probably someone from the family talking about the victim, things like that, you know, which have their place and are interesting. But I think seeing the actual body cam footage specifically of him and how he was behaving straight after the crime before he was you know suspected and yes. arrested um was I thought quite insightful to his behavior and quite shocking there's a particular bit to that we won't spoil but if you don't know the case well you need to watch it and wait till the neighbor of Chris mm -hmm. and Shanann asks Chris and the police, the policeman to come in to his house because he has CCTV footage. That's particularly interesting. And yeah. it, you couldn't really write some of the bits in this. If it was in a film, you would maybe think it was a little bit unbelievable, but it is true, true <laughs> all the way through, unfortunately. So yes, I think it's definitely worth the watch if you've not seen it already. It is obviously a very, very sad crime, but I do think it's worth watching the documentary. So the documentary is, it's on Netflix, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can see it on Netflix. Okay, perfect. So what case have you got for us this week? I believe I already know. So uh, we had discussed before, you wouldn't tell me the details when you were telling the story in another episode because you were going to cover it is that am I right you are right yeah okay, so good. basically um for anyone who is slightly confused um I covered the case of Marion Ross in episode 108 so Marion Ross was a retired bank clerk living alone in her bungalow in Kilmarnock she was brutally murdered in her own home and left with a pair of scissors embedded in her throat. David Asbury from Kilburnie was charged with Marion's murder due to her fingerprint being found on a tin in David Asbury's bedroom, which contained cash the police believe he stole from Marion. In that episode, I explained that David Asbury's conviction was later quashed due to concerns around the authenticity of the fingerprint verification. Another person was caught up in the fingerprint debacle. Her name was Shirley McKee. At the time, her name was Detective Constable Shirley Cardwell. And today I'm going to cover the case of Shirley McKee. Good. The, the wait is over. The wait is over. I would strongly recommend that you go back and listen to that episode first before you listen to this episode. So for our listeners who did listen to episode 108 already, I'll just give you a little bit of a recap. So following the discovery of Marion's body on 8th of January 1997, police and forensics arrived at her home. The crime scene was secured and the names of everyone leaving and entering were logged. CID officer Detective Constable Shirley McKee was one of several officers assigned to the case. On the 9th of January 1997, DC McKee and a detective sergeant visited the crime scene but did not enter the home beyond the front porch. DC McKee made two further visits to the crime scene to collect documents from officers on the scene, but again did not enter into Marion's home. 
20-year-old David Asbury first came to the attention of the police when his worried mother reported he had disappeared on the 13th of January 1997. Asbury returned to his home in Colburnie the following day and came under suspicion of police when they discovered he had worked together with his grandfather on an extension to Marion's home two years earlier. DC McKee and a detective sergeant paid a visit to Asbury's home the same day he returned, 14th of January 1997, and discovered a tin in his bedroom which contained around £1,800 in cash. The tin was left in situ and the senior investigating officer in the case was informed of their findings. DC McKee and her colleague both handled the tin, therefore both submitted their prints for elimination purposes. The same day, a fingerprint was preserved at the crime scene taken from the bathroom doorframe. In early February 1997, DC McKee was notified that her elimination prints were found to be a match with a fingerprint taken from the bathroom doorframe at the crime scene on 14th of January 1997. DC McKee had not entered the crime scene beyond the porch, nor had she visited the home previously. Despite emphasising that the prints could not be hers, the Scottish Criminal Records Office, SCRO, maintained that it was her prints that were found at the scene. The fingerprint was re-photographed and sent again to the SCRO to be rechecked, though a request made by McKee to attend the SCRO to see the fingerprint processing was denied. A further set of elimination prints were also taken from Shirley McKee. The SCRO again confirmed that the fingerprint belonged to Shirley McKee, despite several of the fingerprint experts being unable to conclusively confirm a match. Of eight experts asked to confirm if the fingerprint was that of Shirley McKee, only three did. A further expert signed the joint report confirming the identification. Strathclyde police were not informed at the time that multiple experts had been consulted coming to differing conclusions. Shirley remained resolute, though her colleagues didn't believe her and she was subsequently signed off work sick. During her sick leave, a colleague visited her at her home with the intention of bringing flowers and well wishes. However, Shirley was again encouraged to change her story and admit that the fingerprint was hers. The attempt was in vain, however, as Shirley remained steadfast and denied the possibility that the print could be hers. This led Strathclyde Police to launch an investigation and between February and May of 1997, Shirley attended 12 interviews with police and the Procurator Fiscal. She attended the High Court in Glasgow to provide evidence in the trial of David Asbury in May 1997 and, when questioned, continued to deny that a fingerprint found at the crime scene belonged to her. In June 1997, David Asbury was convicted of murder. In July 1997, police requested a psychological assessment to be carried out on Shirley. The clinical psychologist, Mr Colin Espy, reported, After seeing Ms McKee on 30th of July 1997, I was convinced of two things. First, that she was psychologically normal, and second, that she was telling the truth. Professor Espy followed up his written report with a telephone call to the Strathclyde Police Medical Officer outlining his concerns that the fingerprint identification may be wrong. He said, I was told that this was regarded as an unthinkable explanation because of its implications. Shirley remained off work sick and the investigation by Strathclyde Police continued. In March 1998, Shirley was arrested at home, charged with perjury and suspended from her job with Strathclyde Police. Having been granted bail, Shirley worked on her case leading up to her trial with her solicitor, Angela McCracken, who started looking into fingerprint experts. She came across Pat Wertheim, a fingerprint expert in the US who had a wealth of experience, was a member of the International Association for Identification and on the editorial board of the Journal of Forensic Identification. Thankfully, Pat Wertheim, along with his colleague, David Grieve, agreed to carry out analysis on the print which had been identified as belonging to Shirley McKee at the Marion Ross crime scene. Both travelled to the UK and concluded that the fingerprint, which had twice been confirmed as belonging to Shirley McKee, did not belong to her. In May 1999, 
the trial began in which Shirley McKee was charged with perjury. Experts from the SCRO gave evidence, maintaining that the print found at the murder scene belonged to the accused. Pat Wertheim and David Grieve also gave evidence at trial on behalf of the accused, demonstrating to the jury why the fingerprint evidence was flawed. Advocate Deputy Sean Murphy, prosecuting, said the prints were open to interpretation and asked the jury to accept the evidence of the Scottish experts, whose total experience amounted to more than 100 years. The jury took one hour to deliberate and Shirley McKee was found not guilty. After the verdict at the High Court in Glasgow, Judge Lord Johnston took the unusual step by telling DC McKee that he personally respected her dignity and courage. In June 1999, Shirley McKee was informed that she was no longer suspended from duty. She retired from Strathclyde Police on ill health grounds in December 1999 after fighting to receive her pension. Shirley would have been around 37 or 38 years of age at this point. In 1999, journalist Shelley Joffrey for Panorama began investigating Shirley McKee's case for BBC Frontline Scotland in an attempt to uncover the truth. During their investigation, the BBC approached five further independent fingerprint experts from outside the SCRO, all based in England. All five experts unanimously confirmed the print found did not belong to Shirley McKee. The findings were broadcast in a BBC Frontline Scotland programme in January 2000. The same month, 14 Lothian Borders experts wrote to the Minister for Justice. An excerpt from the letter is as follows. At best, the apparent misidentification is a display of gross incompetence by not one, but several experts within the Bureau. At worst, it bears all the hallmarks of a conspiracy of a nature unparalleled in the history of fingerprints. Following the programme airing, it was established that David Asbury Solicitor had not called for the fingerprint evidence to be re-examined in his client's case. As a result, the BBC also arranged for Pat Wertheim and Alan Bale, formerly with Scotland Yard, to analyse the fingerprint which had led to David Asbury's conviction. Again, it was confirmed that the SCRO had misidentified a fingerprint. The print found on the money tin in David Asbury's bedroom, which contained bundles of cash, did not belong to Marion Ross. The findings were broadcast in a second BBC Frontline Scotland programme, which aired in May 2000. In June 2000, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary, HMCIC, publicly announced that Shirley McKee's fingerprints had been misidentified after they consulted experts from Norway and Holland who further confirmed that the print did not belong to her. As we know from when I covered Marion Ross's case on an earlier episode, David Asbury was initially released from prison in August 2000 pending a full hearing of his appeal. The Crown told the Court of Criminal Appeal in Edinburgh that after independent experts analysed the key evidence, it was satisfied it could not be relied on to sustain a conviction. This led to David Asbury's murder conviction subsequently being quashed. The four experts from the SCRO were also suspended from their roles in August 2000. The following month, the President of the Association of Chief of Police Officers in Scotland, ACPOS, apologised to Shirley and her family. Shirley's father, Ian McKee, is a retired superintendent of Strathclyde Police who has fought to support her throughout her ordeal. In July 2000, the Lord Advocate, responding to complaints from Ian McKee about alleged criminal conduct by officials of SCRO, instructed Mr William Gilchrist, Regional Procurator Fiscal for North Strathclyde, to investigate the allegations of criminality. Deputy Chief Constable James Mackay of Tayside Police and Detective Chief Superintendent Scott Robertson, also of Tayside Police, were appointed and a full inquiry was launched. A team was set up in Octorada Police Station, who relied on the use of fingerprint experts from Durham Constabulary's National Training Centre for Scientific Support to Criminal Investigations to assist in the inquiry. Following David Asbury's release from prison, the request was made for the investigation to be extended to the misidentification of Marion Ross's print on the money tin found in David Asbury's bedroom, which had been ultimately used to convict him of murder. 
In the precognitions submitted by James Mackay and Scott Robertson, they surmised that in their opinion, there had been criminal conduct on the part of certain officials of the SCRO during the prosecutions of both David Asbury and Shirley McKee. This conduct consists of misrepresentation of the facts and failure to disclose both the blind comparisons that were carried out within SCRO on the 17th of February 1997 and doubts expressed by five SCRO officers after those comparisons. The report stated, Clearly the errors were capable of admission at various stages in the process with minimal impact on those making them. The police service has a culture of openness, honesty and integrity. And in such situations, while I believe there would have been frustration by management, there would have been no recriminations in a mistake being made. It is the obdurate and arrogant stance which prevailed through the chain of events, contributing in the conviction of David Asbury and the prosecution of Shirley McKee, which transferred both misidentifications from an error status to criminal action with dire consequences. Mr Mackay said he was disappointed and rather surprised there was no prosecution of staff at the Scottish Criminal Records Office, SCRO. The report had been provided to the ACPOS, Procurator Fiscal and the Deputy Chief Constable of Strathclyde Police in October 2000, but had never been made public. The Procurator Fiscal, William Gilchrist, examined the evidence and interviewed experts before submitting his own report and recommendations to the Crown Office in July 2001. The evidence and the reports were appraised by the Deputy Crown Agent and the Lord Advocate. Having considered all the evidence, the Lord Advocate decided in September 2001 that there was insufficient evidence to justify taking criminal proceedings. In explanation of that decision, the Lord Advocate pointed out that the Mackay and Robertson report was only part of the evidence. There were fingerprint experts independent of SCRO who agreed with the relevant SCRO officials that there had been no misidentification. In addition, if there had been a misidentification, the Crown would have to prove to the criminal standard of beyond reasonable doubt that the relevant SCRO officials, in persisting in asserting their view that there was a correct identification, had acted dishonestly and with criminal intent. Shirley McKee subsequently instigated a claim for £100,000 in damages against the Chief Constable of Strathclyde Police after being found not guilty of perjury. However, Ms McKee lost her claim against Strathclyde Police in 2002 after Lord Emsley ruled that she had not demonstrated that her former colleagues acted with malice. Following the ruling, the four fingerprint experts who had been suspended from the SCRO were reinstated. However, they were not permitted to carry out their normal duties. Following the loss of her claim, Strathclyde Police pursued a claim against Shirley McKee for their legal fees, which amounted to £13,000. I can't handle that. That completely disgusts me that they they actually pursued her for legal fees when this was all on their error in the first place. I, I kind of understand a tiny bit that it's really hard to prove the intent to prove that there was malicious intent but I, yeah i think their conduct overall with the pressuring her shows that there were issues moral issues regardless you yeah. know yeah I so agree. they might and i think it's the doubling down as well i think that's what it is for me they didn't recheck them they so they might not be malicious at the start, it might have been an error at the start, but I think the continued behaviour mm -hmm, shows yeah. malice. And so does the, because if she had lied, later on that could have come out and then she could have been done for perjury then. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. They wanted her to be, commit a, a crime essentially because yeah. they said so. To get out of, to get out of the situation. Yeah. So, so infuriating. She's got more mm -hmm. integrity in one little finger than <laughs> yeah. sounds like any of them did in their whole bodies. I agree. Mike Russell, who used to represent the south of Scotland as a list MSP, described the forces move as outrageous. I think most people would find it astonishing that having been cleared of a wrongful accusation in 1999, relating to a matter for which she was suspended from work in 1997, 
she's still having to fight court cases in order to get the most basic of compensation. He said, When you add it to the actions of Strathclyde police, who now want to put her in a position where she might lose her house, I think most people would regard that as beggaring belief. They may be entitled to the money legally, but they are not entitled to it morally after the suffering that Shirley has gone through. A spokesperson for Strathclyde Police said it was usual for expenses to be awarded to the successful party in a legal case. They said, The total amount of the expense which is to be recovered from Ms McKee is still the subject of further proceedings. In May 2002, 171 experts from 18 countries and 26 USA states signed a statement to the Scottish Minister for Justice calling for a further inquiry. In September 2002, a petition was delivered to the Scottish Parliament signed by four world-renowned experts calling for an independent examination into openness and accountability at the SCRO. In 2005, three Scottish fingerprint service experts from Grampian Police sent copies of their findings to the Lord Advocate and their own Chief Constable. John McGregor, John Dingwall and Gary Dempster said they were unable to remain silent on an issue which was of extreme importance to the future of the profession in Scotland. Their report stated, We are satisfied beyond any reasonable doubt that the mark disclosed on the crime scene photograph was not made by the left thumb of Shirley McKee. They said that an independent inquiry should be undertaken by experts from outside the UK. In response, a statement from the SCRO said legal proceedings involving the McKees were ongoing and it was inappropriate to comment further. It went on. However, SCRO rejects any suggestion that it is failing to play its part in delivering fair and effective justice. We believe that the organisation continues to provide an effective and professional fingerprint service. It has been subject to a detailed and rigorous review and subsequent follow-up by the Independent Police Inspectorate and found to be both efficient and effective. The Scottish National Party MSP Fergus Ewing called the saga a blot on the reputation of Parliament and called on Justice Minister Cathy Jamieson to look at the case. In early 2006, after years of battling her case, Shirley McKee accepted £750,000 in damages. Several months later, Lib Dem MSP Mike Pringle received a copy of the Mackay and Robertson reports and released them in the public interest. Mr Pringle said the Justice Committee should now be able to consider the reports as part of its inquiry into the running of the SCRO and Scottish Fingerprint Service. He said, I think now that they are in public domain, it would be only right for the committee to consider them and learn from what happened, so that we can repair the damage that has been done both in Scotland and to our international reputation. In March 2007, three of the four fingerprint experts who had been reinstated accepted redundancy. However, the fourth, Fiona McBride, declined and was sacked. In April 2007, a book called Shirley McKee, The Price of Innocence, co-written by her father Ian McKee and former nationalist MSP Mike Russell, was published which called for a new inquiry into the matter. A public inquiry was subsequently ordered by the Scottish Government to be led by Northern Ireland Judge Sir Anthony Campbell. Announcing the appointment of Lord Campbell, Justice Secretary Kenny McCaskill said the inquiry marked a significant step forward. He said, For over a decade, the Shirley McKee case has cast a cloud of suspicion and uncertainty, not just over individuals involved, but over the criminal justice system. Previous reviews have shed some light on matters, but they have not fully explained the events. They have not entirely dispersed that cloud. In 2008, the hearing commenced. It heard evidence from 64 witnesses in 250 hours of hearings spanning 57 days. The report into Sir Anthony Campbell's findings was provided in 2011. In his key findings, Sir Anthony said there was no evidence that Miss McKee had entered Miss Ross's house and that a fingerprint mark at the scene had been misidentified by SCRO fingerprint examiners due to human error and there was nothing sinister about this. He said there had been no impropriety by the fingerprint examiners who misidentified the print as these were opinions genuinely held by them. The inquiry also found there was no conspiracy against Miss McKee in Strathclyde Police and the force had taken all reasonable steps to confirm the identification of the marks with SCRO. 
Sir Anthony said the misidentification of two prints relating to Ms McKee and Miss Ross expose weaknesses in the methodology of fingerprint comparison and in particular where it involves complex marks. He said the fingerprint examiners were presently ill-equipped to reason their conclusions as they are accustomed to regarding their conclusions as a matter of certainty and seldom challenged. The inquiry found there was no reason to suggest that fingerprint comparison in general is an inherently unreliable form of evidence, but practitioners and fact finders alike require to give due consideration to the limits of the discipline. Sir Anthony's report also made 86 recommendations for future action. Among the key recommendations was that fingerprint evidence should be recognised as opinion evidence, not fact. Examiners, he said, should discontinue reporting conclusions on identification or exclusion with a claim to 100% certainty. The inquiry also recommended that examiners should receive training, which emphasises that their findings are based on personal opinion and that these differences should not be referred to as disputes. Sir Anthony said that a finding of identification should not be made if there is an unexplained difference between a mark and a print. He also recommended that the Scottish Police Services Authority, SPSA, which now incorporates the former SCRO, should develop a process to ensure that complex marks such as those in the McKee case are treated differently. Following publication of the inquiry report, Tom Nelson, Director of Forensic Services at the SPSA, said the organisation had apologised directly to Shirley McKee and her family. Mr Nelson said, As an organisation, we accept the findings of the inquiry and we expect all of our staff members to do the same. We accept that Shirley McKee did not make the mark known as Y7. We have today apologised directly to the McKee family for the errors that took place in the late 1990s and for the subsequent pain that has caused them. Following Mr Nelson's apology, Ian McKee said, He just apologised on behalf of the SPSA. He accepted the recommendations of the report in full. He apologised to Shirley and myself and our family for the mistakes that were made in the past. It's an extremely important apology because it's the first time I've ever heard anyone say sorry. This is the first real apology that has been made in 14 years. I feel I can move forward myself now. And that is the case of Shirley McKee. And just as a little additional note, Emma, in case you're interested, during the episode, I mentioned one of the fingerprint experts, uh, Fiona McBride, who refused redundancy and was subsequently sacked. She went on to have a lengthy, lengthy battle in order to have her position reinstated with SCRO. Oh, Um, really? mm -hmm. So... That's interesting. She was... Yeah, so she was actually, so she was sacked in 2007. So at that point, she was sacked from the the Scottish Police Services Authority, SPSA, which was actually a body formed in 2007, which incorporated the SCRO. So they'd obviously rejigged things and, you know, changed things around and, and the SCRO was now absorbed by SPSA. So she submitted an unfair dismissal case against her former employer. And she took the case to an employment tribunal, uh, which ruled in 2009 that the SPSA had unfairly dismissed her. Oh, So at that point... What was the reason for dismissal? Did they give a reason? Um, not, that, not that I saw. I, if they did, okay. I didn't pick up. So the tribunal awarded her £31,000 in compensation and ordered her reinstatement as a fingerprint officer. But the SPSA contested the decision at an employment appeal tribunal which ruled in their favour. Oh my God! She then took her case to the court of session where three judges also ruled against her reinstatement. Then she appealed again to the Supreme Court in a unanimous written opinion delivered by Lord Hodge in 2016. The court ruled that the findings of the original employment tribunal reinstatement of Ms McBride with compensation should stand. I'm not... I'm not being funny. I would not be wanting to go back to that job <laughs> after well, all of that hassle. So it was in March 2007 that three of the four fingerprint experts who had been reinstated accepted the redundancy and Fiona McBride had declined and was sacked. So that was in early 2007. 
So the Supreme Court ruling was in 2016. However, when she turned up to work following the reinstatement, they refused her access to the building. And she, she was unable to go back to work. I didn't continue to research the story because I felt it was a side note and I didn't want it to take yes, yeah. focus away from Shirley. That's fair. But I just thought that yeah. was an interesting point, a little kind of addition <sighs> um, that she had subsequently fought for, for years to try and get her position reinstated and um, not sure what the outcome of that was because, as I say, I didn't want it to turn into a story in itself and and take focus from Shirley McKee's case. But I just it thought just it was an interesting like it's side an note. It's an institutional... Yeah, it sounds like it's a cultural thing then, really. That's what it sounds like when you're hearing things like that. You hear what happened to Shirley and then you're hearing what happened with her. It's just so messy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, that is the case of Shirley McKee. So, as we know, the Marion Ross print that was used to convict David Asbury... Pat Wertheim and his colleague established that it was inaccurate. It wasn't Marion Ross's print. And they also established that Shirley McKee's print at the locus at the murder scene for Marion Ross was also not Shirley McKee's print. Now, Pat Wertheim, he's had a long established career fingerprinting in America, primarily with forged and fabricated fingerprints. Um, as I mentioned in the story, that's how Shirley and her legal team came across him prior to her trial for perjury. Pat has kindly agreed to talk to us about these cases and his work as a fingerprint expert coming out for you next week. So, yeah, very excited. Stay tuned think, for that because I think that'll be an interesting conversation. Yeah, I love it when we get experts on. I'm just so frustrated for Shirley. I think the whole thing, mm. even the 750k compensation, it's not enough for what she went yeah. through. She can't get those years yeah. back. She's lost her job. It she sounds like under suspicion. It, it sounds like a huge amount of money. You know, it's not a lot of money for for life. If, for example, she can never work again, I don't know for sure that that's the case. But for a lot of people, having gone through that, hmm. if that was your chosen yeah. career, if you've spent a lot of time in it, and that's what you wanted to do, you also probably wouldn't trust your colleagues anymore, no matter where you worked. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't think, I don't think. It, it might be enough to technically live on for that time, but I wouldn't say it's compensation as well, really, for the rest of your life. Yeah, it doesn't seem no. sufficient, does it? Because like you say, no, it doesn't. If you if you end up being in a position where you, you can and are able to go and embark on another career, you're going to be starting at the bottom of that career ladder and it'll take you a while to, you know... Yeah up there she was in her late 30s when all of this happened she had already chosen her career and progressed within that career so where do you go from there Seven hundred fifty thousand pounds isn't enough to live on for the rest of your life without having a job having a career you know um so it, it isn't it doesn't sound sufficient at all and I you know even though she was able to gain access to her pension because of her age I imagine and the length of service that she had it wouldn't have been a substantial pension usually you have to no. have completed I think it's 30 years service within the police or something to be able to get the full police pension and she wouldn't have been eligible for that I don't no. imagine so yeah no, it's she wouldn't have been but the thing is even ignoring all of the money part, there's no real... You can't put somebody back into the position they were in no. mentally no. Mm -hmm. and in her life generally and all the suspicion yeah. and all your colleagues doubting you or pressuring you and having to go through a trial which is public and everyone mm -hmm. knows and then back and forth. and yeah, It's just torment. Traumatising. Yeah. But so Absolute much respect traumatizing. for her for, for yeah. standing by her truth at uh, the truth and refusing yeah. to because she could have theoretically just lied gone along with it and potentially never heard anything else about it ever again yeah absolutely it's so surprising to hear the circumstances of this case because part of the the core ethics within the police are honesty openness and integrity now she had all three of those things yeah. 
she stuck to the truth. Mm -hmm. She told the truth. She didn't lie. She was consistent throughout. And yet she was fighting a battle against that, despite the fact that she was being open and honest and, and having her integrity. It's just crazy that... I know. Even to hear that but, colleagues were trying to persuade her to change her story and things like that, it's just beggar's belief. When she finally did get her fingerprint disproven, that then led to the other fingerprint being looked at and someone who was wrongfully convicted being yeah. overturned. She's actually doing her job, even when she's not being paid to do her job, inadvertently yeah. by being an honest and true individual. It's yeah. truly remarkable and a disgrace that she was so badly treated. Absolutely. What kind of choice would she have had? If they turned around and said, well, you're no longer suspended, she's not going to go back in and start working as a detective constable on, you know, murder inquiries and things like that with colleagues that have, you know, not believed her. Tried to throw her under the bus. Exactly. So where was she meant to go from there she didn't have options yeah. it was an impossible situation for her and uh, it was unfair because clearly Either lie she had and a then career. if in, if yeah so it's like lie and if in the future they find out that you lied about that then that's perjury or yeah don't lie and be penalized for something that didn't happen and mm. either way your life is going to be flipped upside down and ruined because some people were they reportedly weren't malicious but they were at the very least they were negligent or yeah incompetent yeah and she's paid the price and they've pretty much got off scot-free it's so sad but she's she's a incredible woman incredible woman for her integrity and absolutely for standing so strong and i'm sure at times yeah. that she didn't feel strong throughout that at all i'm sure that that's not what she felt, but that's absolutely what she was. And I like her streak of stubbornness. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. It's really interesting. I'm glad that I didn't try and bully you into giving me more information <laughs> during the Marion Ross case because I'm too curious and I'm nosy. So, yeah, thank you for doing that. Yeah, you I thought it well. was best, you know, the Marion Ross case had already been overshadowed with the Shirley McKee debacle that I didn't yes. want to overshadow her case again by doing the same thing. That's fair. But at the same time, Shirley McKee's case also deserved time of its own, you know, coverage of its own to Absolutely. highlight her battle and, and what had happened to her. And um, they equally both deserve focus, but keeping them separate, I think, was was yeah. important. So, yeah, so hopefully you have a, a lighthearted crime backstory tidbit. Yeah, I do. Something. So uh, it's from um, the, I was going to call it a newspaper. It's from the Daily Mail. <laughs> Are you tired, Emma? <laughs> I'm tired. It's not a newspaper. Well, it's also not, it's not a newspaper. I, I, I refuse to acknowledge it's a newspaper. It's from the publication, <laughs> the Daily Mail online. <laughs> um, and it's about kind of, silly crimes that are reported that aren't aren't crimes really so there are a number of alleged hate crimes that were recorded so you can tell that there's been an MP that's actually tried to raise this as an important cause but it's ended up just being a funny article so they're like please don't okay. call 999 and report crimes that aren't really crimes because you're wasting people's time. The one that I find most ridiculous is that a victim a victim that's in quotation marks complained to police that an unknown dog had filed in an area outside their home and they believed that this was a racially motivated incident <laughs> which is by the, the dog not the owner of the dog by the dog by the dog yes so the dog was perceived to be, to be racist. Um, Can I yeah. just ask what kind of dog it was? I'm just curious. Does it say what breed? It it doesn't say. I'm presuming the dog's identity is being protected in this instance. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> another canine related case logged as an alleged hate crime says suspects dog barking at victim. In which case. My dog's going to get done for multiple things if if you're not allowed to bark at people Barking at all. Victim. Yeah, that's it. And that's that's racially motivated as well, presumably. 
Um, then it gets a little bit more obscure. There's another one. So on another occasion, another supposed victim of racial abuse. Uh, so what he what he suffered as racial abuse was that he received a letter and he believed that the letter addressed to him was opened and then resealed before he collected it from the post office. I don't know how to explain that. And then there was another person who perceived a hate crime because someone reversed into their car, which, you know, understand a little bit, maybe. Mm -hmm. But the reason that she believed that was a hate crime was because she had a poppy on the front of her car for, like, Remembrance Day. So she had somehow decided mm, that, that was I thought it was, a, to, was, like, targeted. Nope. <laughs> no. Um, another, another person found a dead rat in their garden and thought that was a, a racially motivated hate crime. Well, like a cat or so something. Is this, yeah, yeah, there's um, there's a lot oh there. There was a, someone who felt a bus driver had given them a racist look, so they called the police. A racist? Um, what is a racist look? I, I, I have no idea. I don't know. In, perhaps in the same way as you can be racist while opening and closing somebody's mail and then somehow sending it to the post office so they can go and pick it up. Could you imagine the bus driver being interrogated <laughs> be like, and him being like, no, it wasn't a racial look. It was a judgmental look. <laughs> yeah, the dog one was particularly interesting. Um, I mean, sometimes I look at Hugo and I, I wonder if there is a, a single brain cell behind those mm. eyes. I don't think he's capable of being racist. Maybe I'm not giving him enough credit. I don't think he's judgmental enough for that. Yeah. No. Don't Maybe there are racist dogs. Yeah, don't know what goes on goes on inside their minds. <laughs> I don't I I'm pretty I sure when he though. chooses yeah, I'm tr- pretty sure when he chooses to go to the toilet isn't related yep. to the, the skin tone of the person in close proximity. But you shouldn't be letting your dog poo outside people's houses. Don't do that. Yeah, that's shitty. No math yeah, that is shitty. It's just crap all around, really, isn't it? Yeah. But like no, but no, don't be that what guy. race anyone is. Don't be that guy. It's irrelevant. What are you gonna what are you gonna get mad at like pigeons crapping on your car and take it personally? Probably actually. That'll be the next one. That'll be the next yeah. one that comes out. These birds, seagulls, seagulls and pigeons mm. are targeting me. Although seagulls, you know what they're like, they are pretty clever. I reckon they probably could be racist. They're they target to get a chippy. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Oh god madness madness okay well thank you so much for that and uh yeah we will see you next week bye bye